Welcome to the E-Team Sponsor Podcast. I'm Sean Connors, founder and CEO with E-Team Sponsor. Uh, excited to have on the Chalk Talk with us today, two of my favorite coaches here in the California Community College uh, Athletic Association. Uh, we're a uh, pleasure to be joined today with Coach Ben Noonan from Sierra College. He's been there for the last seven years as the head football coach. Prior to that, uh, he's been at Citrus College down in Southern California. Also been at stops at uh, Alabama State, Baylor, Wex, West Texas A&M, Texas A&M, Kingsville. And he's the pride of Santa Rosa, California, and a Cardinal Newman alum. Coach Noonan, thanks for coming on board. Appreciate you having me, uh, Sean. Looking forward to this. You got it. You got it. And then also joined uh, by Rob Snelling. Rob is the head football coach up at Butte College. And he's been uh, he's going to be heading into his fourth year. He's been at Butte for 15 years overall. Uh, Rob played at Boise State for Coach Dirk Cutter and then also GA'd for him down at Arizona State University. Uh, Rob, thanks for coming on the show with us today. Thanks for having me. You got it, man. You got it. Well, coaches, uh, I, let's jump right in. Uh, Coach Noonan, we'll start with you first. Um, hey. Coaching this offseason is a little different, isn't it? A little different than uh, years past? No doubt. No doubt. It's uh... – it's pretty hard not being on the field this time of year for for multiple reasons. How are the uh, how are the thing how are things going? I guess how are you uh, managing the you know the communication with your student athletes with your coaches? Take us inside Sierra College right now in the football program. Uh, how are you guys going day to day? A ton of Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of a lot of position group meetings, and then as the head coach, I just try to. Uh, we, we try to schedule them for Mondays and Wednesdays, the same days we would have been on the field for spring football, uh, Thursday a.m. staff meetings on Zoom. And then I try to pop into each position group's Zoom meeting, show my face, uh, sit in for about five or ten minutes in addition to uh, running the quarterback Zoom meeting. So um, obviously we've given them a workout plan and, and that they, they we hope they're sticking to. But it's it's difficult right now. Yeah, definitely a challenge. I'm sure there's a, a lot of challenges, a lot of coaches out there facing right now in terms of how to run the program. And, uh, but uh, I, know, I know something that uh, probably is a breath of fresh air, Coach. We had the NFL draft uh, this past weekend, and uh, you, you, had a, you had an esteemed alum uh, that graduated from the Sierra College football program. Tell us a little bit about the newest San Francisco 49er, Brandon Ayuk. And uh, I think you were just on KNBR, the local radio station, the flagship for the Niners, uh, I think. Yeah. Right? Yes, I was. Um, he just Brandon deserves everything that's coming his way right now. And I think what speaks the highest testament that could be spoken about him is he's coming out of Herm Edwards camp at Arizona State. And I mean, that's a it's a staff chock full of NFL former NFL coaches. So for him to be drafted in, in the first round to someone, you know, like Mr. Lynch, who has so many ties to the Arizona State program. You know, they obviously uh, are going to tell him straight about the type of character the kid is. And, you know, I mean, for him to jump up the draft boards the way he did in those three months leading up to the draft just speaks because the film's there. The football part took care of itself. His character is off the charts. And I think, you know, Arizona State and, a, and an entire NFL type of staff putting their stamp on him just validifies the type of kid he is. That's awesome. Great news. To, we all need that. We need a lot of positive news uh, right now. And uh, it's great to hear that, a, you know, a, a local community college football program in the state of California uh, got to share in some, uh, some really positive news, some exciting news. Speaking of jumping, is that video really him at Sierra College of him in the one-on-one -on -one drill by the goal line jumping over the kid into the end zone? Was that at Sierra? That is him, and that was real. And we took a lot of heat on social media from all the comments that said, wow, what a lame team. They didn't even celebrate. No one got crazy. <laughs> no one ran up and hugged him. Well, when uh, when CBS, or I, I think it was KCRA, did an interview with, or, or Joe Davidson did an interview with our quarterback at the time, Joe Curry out of Folsom High School, he simply said, Brandon did that kind of stuff every day in practice. That's why none of us went crazy in the video. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to see it all the time. We see it one time and lose our minds. Yeah, uh, that's, that's and everyone, oh, what a lame team. No one even got excited, you know. Uh, that's we too took funny. Some that's too funny. Well, he uh, uh, saw that. He talk about jumping off the film. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, play on words there. He, that was incredible. So for those of you that haven't seen it, hop on YouTube and check out uh, Brendan Ayuk's highlights from Sierra College and 
him uh, leapfrogging over a player at the goal line during uh, uh, drills one day. Pretty, pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, Rob, let's transition over to you, man. Um, you're up there in uh, the beautiful part of Northern California. And uh, how are things at Butte College? How's, how's the football program? How are things going right now? Uh, very, very similar to what Coach Noonan's experience down in Sierra. We are Zoom fest all week long, pretty much. And uh, we've got position meetings going on almost every day of the week. I try to get on as many of those as possible just so we can talk with each group. Uh, we've got a staff meeting once a week. I mean, everybody's kind of got a different scenario right now in terms of our staff. People's families are different. And some of our guys in our staff have other jobs. Uh, like Coach Noon and I have talked. I mean, we're, we're part-time teachers now for elementary school with our kids. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're doing a little bit of everything and just trying to keep things rolling as best we can. So uh, we're treating this spring ball period, like Coach said, we'd normally be on the field and be having practice, schools coming through, and guys being able to showcase themselves a little bit, and uh, schools able to start putting their list together of who they're going to target for next year's class. So what we've decided to do is treat this spring period almost like a normal install period like we would for spring or fall. So we're doing one install meeting a week, bringing that stuff in. All these guys, for the most part, are returners. There's a handful of guys that transferred in January, but um, we're doing an install each week and just kind of going through them. So uh, I've been meeting with the receivers, uh, you know, which is different for me. I coach tight ends, but, um, you know, our receiver coaches is looking at some different things. And so I'm doing a couple meetings a week and then uh, my coach to line for 11 years. So it's hard to detach myself fully from that. So I'm normally at every line meeting and uh, just pouring through film. I mean, I watch, you know, I've been watching through nine years of film of all kinds of different stuff, just figuring out ways to try to see if we can get better. There you go. Awesome. I love it. We've, uh, now, now there's a, there's a, what do they say? The, um, uh, there's an opportunity amidst the chaos. There's opportunity, right? Like you, your opportunity is to break down a lot of film. Uh, and mm -hmm. it sounds like uh, you and a lot of coaches are definitely taking that approach. How, you know, I'll open this question um, up to both of you. Uh, just right now, it's obviously there's a challenge in terms of the way you've done things in the past when it comes to running spring practice, being able to have, you know, the high school kids uh, that haven't graduated yet, the ability to attend spring practice, uh, uh, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, I'm sure that's it created some challenges eligibility. Uh, so talk to us a little bit maybe about some of the challenges you guys are seeing and then maybe the way that you guys are leading through uh, these times. Go ahead, Rob. Um, for us, I think the biggest questions are probably going to be revolving around eligibility. And so, you know, not that we have a ton of guys, but I would say we've got some uh, two sport athletes. So we had a few guys, I mean, probably had around seven or eight guys that were doing track and field, did a couple meets, and then obviously everything got shut down. So now that kind of resets some things for, for them elig eligibility wise, that changes it. So now that that season's gone, it won't count against them. So, um, you know, they still have their classes intact, but, you know, again, like we talked before, I mean, the eligibility thing is hard and trying to figure out um, just how people transition to these online formats. And, you know, us as teachers, our students um, and our players, just trying to figure all that out. Not everyone's an online student. And so, I know everyone's doing the best they can to communicate. I think teachers are really trying to work with everybody across every campus in the country right now and just trying to do the best they can to make sure people are getting their questions answered, that they're still getting the material they came for. Um, I think the, the hardest part, it's like, you know, Coach and I have talked about with our kids and I'm sure our players go through the same thing and you mentioned before, is just the social aspect and just being able to be around their friends and the people they're there and having that experience, especially being in college, that's a huge experience for a lot of people. And that's a part that's missing for a lot of people right now. Yeah, absolutely. Coach Noonan, how about you? Yeah, very similar thought process uh, here as well. Um, I worry the most about our, our just our current guys that are, you know, transitioned to online courses that had a pretty full load to graduate this May and accept scholarships and be Division One eligible or be eligible for the Division Two and smaller schools worry about them the most. I mean, you can check in with them as much as you want. Our counselors and support staff are doing an excellent job of updating me. And I, I kind of gave them some of the guys that I felt were red flags and they, they reach out to them once a week. But like Rob said, uh, there's so many kids that are just not online learners. They, I mean, they have to be in a classroom or they won't even turn on a computer or some of them don't even have computers at home, you know? Sure. And so we've been uh, really doing a good outreach program with the techno uh, technology aspect where if a kid doesn't have a Chromebook or doesn't have certain technology aspects, uh, I think Sierra College has done a, a phenomenal job supporting their students, not just the student athletes, but all the students in general 
they there's a system where they can order one online and they can come pick it up and obviously it's a checkout process that they got to return it um, but they've helped in that regard and, and a few other things as well so you know pretty pretty proud of, of the college and the way they stepped up their game in that aspect I'll tell you what, that's probably one of been one of the most encouraging things that I've heard uh, throughout the course of the last, you know, 45, 60 days has been the response to the adversity from the schools. You know, it's been, and again, not obviously we focus in the, in the student athlete realm and the coaches realm. So we're, we're so focused on that, but it sounds like most of the schools have had very similar types of responses from, you know, the same that Sierra and Butte have had. So and at the end of the day, right, that's why we're in it to do what we do, right? Matriculate the student athletes through the system. Uh, you hope their last down of football in the last course that they take in college is definitely not at your respective schools. It's to move on and, and do it somewhere else. So, JC like, football, bringing them in, getting them out. Bringing them in, getting them out. It's, it's a turnstile. Get them on, in, both them out. Ends. Both yeah. <laughs> on both ends. Both ends. Recruiting on both ends. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, and that's, you know, so that'll take me to my next question then is, you know, recruiting wise, What's it been like with the four-year guys? You know, how have you guys been communicating with them? Have you seen a difference in recruiting? Um, you know, maybe, you know, pros, cons, or maybe some, some positives to take from, from this uh, with the way they've been recruiting. Go ahead, Coach. Okay. Um, certainly the aspect is lost of somebody being able to come out to the field and be like, yeah. who's that guy? Yeah. Um, you can send people lists until you're blue in the face. Um, but then they come out and they see a guy move in real time and it, and it can sway them one way or the other, you know? Sure. Um, so certainly that aspect is lost, but there has been kind of an uptick in electronic communication. I would, I would say, um, a lot, a lot more coaches reaching out for the list this time of year than were before for whatever reason. Um, but again, nobody, nobody on the road, nobody in person, nobody that, you know, they might be wavering on a kid or they got they got two kids that are pretty similar and the deciding factor might have been them sitting down face to face with that kid and being like man this is a good kid you know yeah. so that that's that's a challenge um as far as bringing kids in and that recruiting aspect i, I haven't seen you know we had everything pretty well in order and everything kind of rolling at the time that this all hit um i'm sure that we'll lose lose a few kids that we thought were coming but that happens every year whether there's a pandemic or not <laughs> yeah <laughs> no doubt well it's a uh, yeah it's something to be said for the fact that no coaches can't show up and and uh and and, and have a student athlete pass the eyeball test or uh, the character evaluation test face to face you're right i'm sure that's definitely uh, been a challenge for them it'll be interesting to see how many schools you know go through a process recruiting a kid sight unseen right never really even being able to see a kid um, you know, with uh, face to face. So, or Bob, even, anything, or even in this manner here. You know, yeah. Just on a Zoom call with the kid. I mean, it's the best thing to, that you can get as close to being face to face to kind of judge character. Yeah, absolutely. And we've heard we've heard coaches and administrators that have said, "Hey, they're they're now doing campus tours through Zoom, literally mm -hmm. turning the phone around or the computer yeah. around, saying, hey, this is where your class would be, and here's what your dorm room would look like.' So." Uh, certainly, certainly uh, uh, crazy times. Rob, how about you? Anything you've seen on the recruiting end, either or? It's, it's been pretty similar to what Coach said. It's just been um, a lot of communication through email. I think people are really trying to reach out because they know they're not going to be able to get out now. That's kind of been finalized. I mean, everybody's kind of hoping that they could get out and do what they do and kind of keep that routine, but that obviously isn't going to happen for this year's cycle. Um, so now it's just, hey, who else is left? Who do you still have remaining? And I think there's still people out there looking. I think it's uh, a little bit tougher probably for the four-year schools at this point because most of them are not having spring ball. So it's hard for them to really judge exactly where they are if they had some people that either academically or athletically aren't quite where they thought they would be. And if they might go out and try to find something more at our level, that's where sometimes guys at our level see that later spring opportunity pop up, um, whether that's a freshman qualifier, maybe that's a guy just was under-recruited and popped up late. So um, some of those things will change, I think, a little bit, and uh, that's a little tougher in, in our world as far as guys getting out, I think, this year for guys that are done playing that might have normally had something late that just because people have gone through spring and evaluated where exactly where they are. But um, I still think guys are going to get opportunities as long as they take care of business and um, do, do what they need to do academically. Like Coach said, that's probably the biggest challenge. I mean, you know, you get all the communication and email and text and all those things are great, but ultimately seeing people face-to-face -face and continuing um, 
to have a conversation day in, day out so guys get things done and uh, having some positive reinforcement from yourself or from your staff, I think that goes a lot further sometimes than just a, a kid getting a text or an email. Yeah, that's great. That's great insight. I think it'll be really important for a lot of co- you know coaches that are listening. I think it's important that they understand, hey, look, like it's, the communication's different now. The communication's going to be the key to success for – for uh, coaches, you know, communicating, hey, this is what we need from a recruiting standpoint. Uh, kids that are coming into the junior college program, communication is so important. And it uh, sounds like you guys are definitely handling it the best way you can, building trust with the student athletes and your four-year college coaches. So uh, great job to both of you guys. Um, Rob, I can't let you off the hook. I got <laughs> I to gotta, I gotta ask. I mean, right. we talked about Brendan, Brandon Ayuk earlier. Yep. How in the world – did he play for your brother in high school and not play for you? Well, you know, there's a funny thing when uh, certain styles of offense uh, might play better to the receiver position than others. And, um, you know, when the ball's being put in there a few more times and uh, the guy wants to be a receiver and you call him and you think he might be a DB. So I thought uh, <laughs> probably be either. I don't know. He might have ran away at the first time he heard me say defensive back because he was a pretty good corner in high school too. So, um, you know, just me knowing what the market's been over time at junior college, corner's always kind of been a highlight position that people always are looking for to get better or just feel a need. And so um, watching his high school film, if you go back and watch it, I'm sure you pull that up anywhere too and see him playing defensive back. I mean, he's a guy that I think could, could do it there as well. I mean, at the, le- at the level, he's going to get the opportunity. And so um, obviously did great things. That receiver developed, went and did a great job for Coach Noonan twice against us on a reverse kick return and on a wildcat play so that was awesome <laughs> uh, you know th- not that you remember or anything i remember any of that stuff at all but, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, but um, i'm very excited for him i mean and again you know we're not going to get every guy and um in recruiting we're all going to do the best we can but you know the guy's got to pick where, where the fit is and so you know i think for him he, he did a good job picking a spot to fit him obviously we would love to have him um you know but i think once coach newman got the hooks in him for the offense that was it it's done deal so um, you know, I'm, I'm excited for him. That's great. That's great. Well, good. Well, I had, had to give you a little bit of a hard time there because uh, I just learned about it here at the beginning of the uh, call today. So yeah, I probably I should have to myself. Yeah, I had to give you a hard time. It'll make for good. Hey, it'll make for a great podcast. People will love I, it. I certainly wasn't going to bring it up. <laughs> I'm not uh, in sharing what our record is against Butte on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we're not bringing that up. Yeah, uh, that's great. To gen- gentleman handshake there, right? Yeah, we'll keep that. Let bygones be bygones. Well, good. Well, um, we'll get into a little bit of rapid fire here. We'll have some fun. Uh, this is usually a time where we like to uh, allow the coaches to share their story a little bit more uh, through a number of questions in our rapid fire two minute drill. So um, uh, we'll start with you, Coach Noonan. We'll have a little fun. Um, you've been at Sierra a while now, but uh, you know, in the community college game for 10 plus years. Uh, but you've had an opportunity to obviously coach at Division One level, Division Two level, um, and uh, and so you've had had quite the uh, the coaching background. So we'll have some fun here and give a chance for our listeners to to learn a little bit more about you. So uh, put right, you on the good. spot. Put you on the spot right out of the gate. Sounds good. Who's, who's your favorite player you've ever coached? Well, yeah, man, that 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 one. Woo! I'm gonna have to go old school so none of my current players get upset about me. Or <laughs> Good but point. I had a kid named Charlie Martin that played for me at West Texas A&M uh, and Division II school. He was a walk-on, uh, did not have any scholarship money offered to him. He was a local kid from Canyon in the area. Uh, Charlie Martin, I buried him. He's a receiver on a depth chart every year. I was in charge of recruiting California JC guys, right? And, and I'd be like, Charlie, you are going to come in at like sixth on the depth chart. And, and for two straight years, he was at least fourth on the depth chart. And he set every school record in receiving there. Um, went on, got a cup of coffee with the Carolina Panthers. And then he, um, he got into broadcasting. He's doing media type stuff now out in Texas. So that's cool. Uh, I would say he's one of my favorite kids just because, you know, D2, you don't have a lot of bells and whistles. You don't, you don't fly the private jets everywhere. And you don't get all the top stuff and he was a grinder he walked on I buried him on a depth chart every year and boom he just (laughs) he took that personal but then we still kept a good relationship that's great that's great I love it over overcame and uh and and made an impact on coach Noonan that's awesome uh coach uh uh, you've you've had an opportunity to coach with a number of coaches um who would be the leader that you would point out maybe having the the biggest impact on yourself 
I am, oh boy, there's been so many, so many good coaches. One guy that comes to mind is Don Carthel. Again, when I was at West Texas A&M, um, he just brought the family aspect into things. Uh, we had weekly in the off season, it was mandatory that you and your family or your wife or significant other came over to a barbecue at his house and did swimming and all that stuff. And they get to the point where you'd be like, man, I do not want to go this week, you know, <laughs> but um, he forced that, that family atmosphere. And um, I really learned a lot from him and try to, try to do the same with our staff and, and, and try to keep that family aspect in, in the back of my mind. Cause I've also worked for coaches that, you know, meet just to meet. You got to be the first one in the office, the last one to leave, even if all your work's done. And he was never that way. So, um, uh, and I still stay in contact with him now. His son is the head coach now um, at Stephen F. Austin, doing a great job. And that's Colby Carthel. He won a, a national championship at Texas uh, A&M University of Commerce A&M. Um, and I coached with him at West Texas as well. So Don Carthel. That's awesome. Coach, a lot of coaches listening, they all have their philosophy. They have a background in, you know, whether it's offense, defense, special teams, a special uh, or a specific aspect of the game. Um, philosophically, in uh, your, the football program at Sierra College, describe in two or three words, what is the philosophy of Sierra College football? Air it out. <laughs> I love it. Well, you're, this, then I already know the answer to the next question. Third down, draw or screen? Ah, shovel pass. Shovel pass. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Perfect. That's awesome. That's all you need to know. Hey, I was a quarterback. You're like, you're just, you're, I'm, I'm coming to play for you, coach. I'm yeah, ready to go. go. I'm ready yeah. to air it out. That sounds good. You had me at air. That's fantastic. But I grew up in the 90s, so I played with guys that ran an offense more like what Rob runs, which is 21, 22, smack you in the face, power, God's play, right? It's a nightmare to, to, to prepare for, absolutely. Oh, man. I'll tell you what, we've got, I got a couple, we have a couple of guys that work for us here at E-Team Sponsor that actually played against Butte College uh, during their, their JC careers, and they all said the same thing at the end of those games. I've never been hit <laughs> by an offensive player like I was hit when I played Butte College. So, uh, Coach, I'm sure that, yeah, that got you to smile there. That's good. We got you to smile there. All right, very similar set of questions, Coach. So, we'll, uh, we'll pop over to you next. Um, so uh, we'll start off with the, with the fun one. Uh, your favorite player that you've coached? I don't know if I can say favorite, but the, uh, probably the most interesting guy I ever had here was Danny Watkins, who came down from Canada and uh, was a firefighter between the ages of like 18 and 22 and had never played football. And so came down here and uh, my coach said, I mean, great athletes make us great coaches, make us geniuses. And uh you know, walk in the door at 6'4", 280 pounds and can run with pretty much anybody on our team. And I'm coaching online. I'm feeling pretty good about it um, as, far, as far as the physical side of it. Now, the football side of it, uh, that's like teaching a guy in his first year of football. So I've got a grown man, 22 years old, that doesn't know if it's pumped or stuffed. So, you know, we're trying to get it going. And, I mean, I literally – we had an older, another older guy that played next to him that had coached. And – I was like, your job is to tell Danny what to do. If he has a question, you were answering. I mean, you go back and watch film. You know, we had our protections and different things we do. And I'd say, you know, you got to know if it's one back or two back and how that changes your stuff for you. He was our left tackle. So, I mean, you'd see, you know, if we audible or change a play at the line of scrimmage, you know, all of a sudden he'd be in stance and just turn back and look. How many backs are back there? Okay. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah. and so uh, it wasn't too hard to tell when we were audible. But, uh, you know, just the, the progress he made from year one to year two was unbelievable taking a guy that had never really played. It was almost easier in a way for me to have somebody that had those many physical gifts that had no habits. And so I didn't have to break any habits and um, just really ate it up. You know, he, again, guy from Canada and we're getting into year two and he's getting recruited by everybody in the country and he's getting tired of it. And he's like, man, coach, I just want to turn my phone off. I mean, I got, you know, wow. every school in the country calling me and it's just getting to wear me out. And he's like, you know, as things progress, we're getting closer. He's like, I think I have a shot to play in the NIFL. Like, well, that's the NFL. Um, <laughs> and so um, I said, you know, just got to see how things progress. I said, if you can continue to grow year in, year out, you know, there might be a chance there. And so he went on to Baylor, played there when uh, Robert Griffin was there, started for every year, or excuse me, every game for two years. I left tackle for them, ended up being a first-round pick for the Eagles. 
Yeah. Awesome. What a great story. That's, those are the, and, and when we always ask that question of our coaches, it's, it's not often that it's the most talented player that they've ever coached. It's sometimes it's the story that's really impacted them the most, you know? So that's awesome. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. More story. Honestly, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, if you got more, let's share it. I'd love to hear more. Oh, Danny. Well, he's, he's a firefighter now. That's what he wanted to do. So he's still, he got married, lives in Waco and, uh, is a firefighter down there. So moved back there. He bought himself a fire truck while he's playing for the Eagles. So he had his own fire truck. <laughs> uh, played a couple of years there, went down and played with the Dolphins for a year. And at that point he was getting up in his late twenties and uh, you know, the NFL thing was something that I know he wanted to do, but I think that he knew in his heart, he's going to be a firefighter for a living. And so he was ready to make, make that move to the next phase of his life and um, moved back to Texas, got married and has twins and his role. That's awesome, man. That is I was on the story. Baylor staff that got fired. He was up on our recruiting board. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> coach was the, first to offer him. the funniest story probably with him was the O-line coach at uh, the University of Arkansas at the time was absolutely beside himself that Danny would pick Baylor at that time over Arkansas. Hmm. He was just absolutely – Was it Sam be, Pittman? It was the O-line coach at uh, Arkansas. Okay. He was Coach Summers. Um, okay. Long time, great coach, coaching vet, O-line all over the place in the country – you know, high level guy. And he's trying to recruit me. And like coach, you can tell you, like, Hey, you're not recruiting me. You're recruiting him. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'll talk to him, but I said, you got to understand. I said, he doesn't know the difference between Arkansas and Arkansas state. Was it coach K? Yeah, coach Summers. Oh. Yeah. So I think it was Mike Summers. So, but I mean, he just didn't understand. He goes, this is the sec. I go, he has no idea what the sec is. He has no clue. So you know what? I'd love to play for you. My eligibility's up. Um, so I don't know what to tell you, man. I said, Baylor offered him. He feels great about it. They were the first one, one of the first schools to offer. Uh, he set that visit. Coach has been out here a couple times. They got a great relationship, and that's that's what he's doing. And that's where again we talked about fit earlier. You know, it was a fit, and yeah. that's where he wanted to go, and it turned out great for him. That's awesome. You know, it's, and that's that's that was something that I think you know when you hear these stories, these student athletes, and the opportunities that they have, it's so often that you hear that it's a co it's a it's student athlete that you know probably isn't used to the the fame and attention, and they they get that first offer and they're, you know, almost kind of shut it down early, prematurely. Like, I just don't want to have to deal with this anymore. I just want to make that decision so I can focus on football and keep things simple. So yeah, we had a guy do that last week. <laughs> and so. that happens, right? I mean, it's, it's uh and look, if, if I, I, I got to imagine you guys would, would probably empower your student athlete. Hey, if they make the decision and they want to focus on school and, you know, and, and, and just the season that's up ahead, I got to imagine from a coaching standpoint, does kind of help to minim minimize distractions and make things easier, I'm sure. I think it helps for them just to focus on their season and their school that, that it's done. If you know, I mean, I think a lot of guys like to, if they are in the position to get it done before the season starts, they would probably rather do that. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Well, good. Well, uh, I'll, I'll get a couple more, uh, a couple more fire, uh, rapid fire questions here at you real quick. So same thing, you've had a chance to, uh, you know, you've been at Butte a long time. Obviously, you, you've been there with some great, uh, coaches that have been up there you've uh, been underneath coach cutter uh, who are maybe some of the leaders uh, that you've uh, you've worked with in the past that have had a really profound impact on you um like coach said I mean there's so many guys I've had the ability and uh, good fortune to play for coach with all those things and um, some great head coaches coach Rigsby's a guy that is my boss now our athletic director I played for him here at Butte in the late 90s and then he hired me to my very first coaching job in 2003 and uh, when he moved to athletic director position in 2006, came back, and then um, was appointed the head coach in 2017. So, I mean, he's kind of been there for all of it for me. And so, I mean, really from the beginning of my college career as a player um, all the way up through now, you know, he's a, he's a big part of my life and um, huge influence on me. That's awesome. And then uh, the last question that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through, you're, uh, you're on the three-yard line. You've got one untimed down. Coach, what's the call to get the ball in the end zone? Well, it would all depend on our personnel. And so uh, – How about this? I, I, I think we've ran a few scouts against Butte College. I'm going to go with maybe a 22 personnel. How's that? Uh, it could definitely be a 22 personnel. Depends on kind of how the game's going. But um, there's a couple little play actions in there we like that we could, could dial up. Um, you know, once in a while there's a trick play here or there that I'm not afraid to call whenever. Not, it doesn't always work. But, uh, you know, I mean, if it works, that's great. If it doesn't, you're an idiot. But yeah. – <laughs> I'll call it. I mean, if I think it's there, I'll call it. And any time, any down, I don't care. If we feel like it's there and we've done the study and we have an opportunity to hit a play, we're going to do it. I love it. I love it. Confidence. Confidence in the, in the, in the, uh, the scouting and the play call sheet. I love it. 
All right. Well, hey, we'll um, we'll get into some we'll get into some X's and O's next. So uh, uh, we'll go ahead, Coach Noonan. We'll have you fired up first. Let me fire up the uh, the screen there on your end, and we, you can uh, you can walk us through some film. What we typically like to do during the chalk talk is have coaches get a chance to uh, talk through maybe a play, a concept, or something that's specific to them that uh, you know that they they do or have done in the past. It could be even a technique. So this is an opportunity for coaches to sharpen their pencil that are that are listening or watching on our YouTube channel, and an opportunity for them to to pick up some X's and O's. So. Uh, Coach Noonan, we'll, we'll uh, share your screen and turn it over to you. Okay. Well, it's going to refer back to what you asked me about third down. Yes. Um, all right. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. I just I I think I think the draw plays really evolved into the shovel pass because it's a lot less obvious. Um, the running back doesn't have to be right next to the quarterback. Um, it still sells pass, um, and you can still get get the you know the effectiveness of the old school draw. Um, when we, when we started running the shovel, I learned, I learned, uh, this system at West Texas A&M, um, Lee Hayes was the offense coordinator at the time. And he would put us all in a van, the offensive staff and take us to Texas tech. And that's when Mike Leach was there. And Mike Leach was an incredible, incredible host. Um, I got a chance to sit in on his quarterback meetings. All our position coaches got to sit in on the position meetings. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say it now as a head coach, but the game was to see how many VHS cutups you could steal and get them <laughs> back to the van. Um, and, uh, and there was, uh, who was, I think it might've been Sonny Dykes. who was the outside receivers coach at the time. He's now the head man at SMU. It, we came back the second spring and he goes, you guys know if you guys would like some cutups that we'll, we'll provide you any type of cutups you want. And I didn't know what, I was like, what the hell is he talking? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway let's see if i can figure this deal out here there we go all right so our shovel pass um obviously we've got a little bit going on any type of screen i just recommend any screen that somebody's going to run that they tie it to a real pass concept of theirs so we do run a three by one stick concept like this um, and the quarterback does actually have the option if this stick is uncovered to throw it out there um, as opposed while everybody else is running shovel. So uh, there is there is that option for him to do that if it's uncovered. But so I like we like tying any of our screen plays, your tailback slip screens, your wide receiver tunnel screen to on the back side a concept you actually run. And sometimes you can even give the quarterback the option to throw that that concept back there if it's open. So. Um, you know, nothing helps sell the defense um, in an opposite direction than you want their eyes than running something they've actually already seen during the game, you know. So, and if you really have the option to throw it there, it, it makes it realistic even more. So that's what the wideouts are doing. They're running a stick game, three by one stick game concept. Um, obviously, the receiver to the shovel side uh, should be running a runoff. We can run it out two by two as well. Um, this will be a quick wide screen and then we'll get into to the look up front um, but you can really see what it does to this linebacker that's highlighted right here uh, he's the unblocked man in the box so the quarterback's got the quarterback's responsible for him he's got to move him with his eyes he's got to get him out out of the play with his eyes because he's this guy's not blocked okay so good job there doing that um, and then this is actually a, a older cousin of Brandon A. It's playing tailback right there, Conrad Kenny, also. How, out of, uh, how, how about that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, just everybody has their own calls. Uh, center and play side guard will be working what we would call an ace to uh, whatever number or whatever guy is there. Same, same concept is zone that way as well. No different. Um, the, the, you know, obviously we prefer to run it to the low shade. Uh, makes it a little bit smoother transition, but we'll, we have a clip here where we actually run against the bare front as well. Um, so these guys are in combo. We got to get high hat, high hands, sell pass. We tell the tackles do a horrible job in pass setting. Um, you know, do your worst pass set or, or your worst attempt at blocking a cheat off the edge. So we kind of want to let them win. Uh, but they, they can't be too obvious about it. So let those guys win. When they get to the hip, open your hips, run them by. Um, the backside guard, biggest thing, just don't get your face crossed. 
uh, maybe maybe even help yourself out by taking a power step inside before you sell pass. So a quick little a quick little jab step inside before he, he sells pass. And then the combo here is obviously the bread and butter of the play. Um, if this guy was to a loop over um, on the snap, so we work this play versus a lot of games uh, with these two in combination because I think that's a must. You got to work a ton of games right there. Um, it's not always going to be perfect how it's lined up. So this way it worked out perfectly how, how you would like it to be. Uh, the ace, we talk about the guard here. He's going to feed the combo guy over to the center. Center takes him over, and, and then he's going he's gonna to work up to the play side backwards. So here it is uh, from, from this angle here. All right, jump into the next one here. Similar type deal. This time, um, we got the back to the three receiver side. No big deal. Be a lot easier to, to see from that end zone angle. Again, uh, tackle selling pass, getting the ends up field. Backside guard not letting him get his face crossed, but also selling pass to get his guy up field. And then the play side guard and center on the ace. Uh, ready for any type of combo, any type of slant, any type of movement. Um, very rarely in practice, we may install it without movement, but then every time after that, there's always going to be some type of movement going on. This is, uh, you, you mentioned DVC in the past. Here they go. Uh -huh. they do, here we go. Yeah, here they go. do some crazy stuff now. We're in, we're in four wide 10 personnel, and they're in a bear, you know? Yeah, so. Coach, Coach Dar, hey. <laughs> I played for Coach Star. Coach Star, I coached with Coach Star. He is aggressive. There he is. does some no incredible stuff in the back end too. I love it. It's like the brackets and the combos and the inside leverage and the outside leverage. You're like, God dang it! And I had to. Co Man I was coaching this quarter. Yeah. I was coaching offense at that time, coaching the quarterbacks. It was. I mean, our the toughest defense. No offense to anybody else we played, but the toughest defense we we faced was our own defense every week in practice. It was. It was crazy what he does on defense. Shout out to Coach Dar. Very Absolutely. creative on defense. Very creative. Yeah, he's uh, one of my favorites. So this is the bear. And then obviously versus a bear front, you got five on five. Um, so you're going to have an unblocked backer if it happens to be a, a you know, a 52. But right now, most most time, anybody who runs a bear against us, I'm they're usually only going to have one linebacker, if any, in the box. Um, so in this particular look, we only have the one guy here that the quarterback needs to get out of there with his eyes. Um, and then sell, you know, by the lineman selling pass, it helps with those drops. So then it's going to be up to the quarterback pitching him open off the nose. So anytime we face a bear front, wherever that nose goes, the running back's going to work opposite of the nose and the quarterback's got to pitch him open off, off the nose guard. So, um, this is it right here. Nice. Wow. This concept actually uh, was a Texas Tech uh, concept, but they would bring, they would actually do it where the back steps up and then it would hit like a zone left. And so they would only run it to the left, um, the court with a right-handed quarterback, they'd only run it to the left and with a left-handed quarterback, they'd only run it to the right. Okay. And then it would be the same concept we're talking about on the front side of ours except it would be on the back side and it, and he would come across the formation. We just found that it, you know, it didn't hit as quick. And if one guy up front got his butt whipped, the play was, was ruined. Was toast, so yeah. the way we hit it play side, a little bit quicker action, we have a little bit more success with it than, uh, than we used to when running it the old school way. But that's our shovel pass. That's, that's Sierra called shovel pass. Right there. I love it. Coach Noonan, that is awesome. That is great. I think for coaches that are, you know, looking to uh, uh, expand their, um, you know, expand off of their draw or screen game, this is a great, uh, great addition and uh, coached up from Coach Noonan, who's been running this for, you've been running this for a long time, Coach. Uh, yes, sir. Since uh, 05. Since 05. It's awesome. It. Yeah. It's beautiful. Beautiful. We Stop appreciate you sharing that. Here, there yeah, there. perfect. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. That's great stuff. I know there's going to be a lot of, a lot of coaches out there that uh, that will pick up a lot from that. Uh, love the love the uh, huddles. Just and, and video editing has just come so far now when it comes to uh, being able to draw things up. It looks fantastic, and 
sure a lot of coaches will get a lot out of that. So thank you. No for more sharing paper that. playbooks, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. No. No. Hey, go take this home and study. Well, I don't know. You know? Maybe. Uh, maybe Butte. They're so old school. I don't know, man. They'll punch you <laughs> right in the mouth right after they hand you a playbook. Yeah. You know? You'd be surprised. <laughs> uh, I love it. Here's your playbook. Here's a yeah. Here's your mouthpiece. I stopped piece. doing that because I get so pissed off when I'd see him at the bottom of someone's locker. You know, I kill the kid at practice. <laughs> yeah it's come a come a long way hey now we have the oversight too right now you can log in you can see who's watched how long they've watched i mean that's the the the, the transparency and accountability factor is i think that's made football a better sport because kids are now being held accountable um it's 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 a lot different it's a lot different empowering the coaches that's for sure and the player and the players well good well coach thanks for sharing that that was awesome uh, rob Let's, uh, let's fire yours up, man. I can't wait to see what you got in store for us. Yeah, we do a few things. Um, so I'm gonna yes, pull, you do. I'm going to pull up uh, some of our stuff from a play action clinic I put together. This okay. last year. And so um, there's some variation, but there's also a lot of similarity really in what we're doing. I think that's kind of all of us. And so uh, we're trying to make it as easy as we can on our players. So a lot of concepts tie together. Uh, really depends on who we're playing. But, you know, we're going to see some of the same – coverages and same things and same tendencies out of other people throughout the year. So we just try to build off that as we go. Um, then with promotion. So a little bit about our program, like I said, you know, for us, um, you know, some stuff about our program for other coaches out there. This is really since coach Rigsby started it, like I mentioned before, he's really the founder, I think of our program. And that's how I look at that, but um, been able to have a lot of success here over a long period of time. And um, you know, our play action pass, this is just kind of some of our base rules. And so we talk about with our players a lot is that it needs to match current or past game plans that people are prepping for and try to break tendencies. And a uh, big thing is, you mentioned earlier, uh, we do enjoy the contact aspect of football. And uh, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, but you got to be able to run the ball to have success in your play action game. There's no way to really get anything out of it unless you are running the ball well. So um, big thing to Coach Jordan, my previous head coach I worked for, you should joke around with us on the run game, but – thing gets lost and the easy tip I could give for O-line is to sell the run game up front and so I mean his two favorite words are low hat you know I so said you go low hat he was a defensive back in college defensive back coach defensive coordinator so those guys in the back end see hats pop up it's passed they're out of there and so I mean that's something we've tried to stress in terms of when we sell that play action game it needs to look like run so you know low hat for any you know looking for any small coaching tips out there for guys and uh, we're just trying to create conflict and take what's there. So that's kind of, you know, what we talk about when we talk about play action. Um, and so this is from our bowl game this last year. This is one of my favorite plays of the year, just a big play for us. It was a frustrating game in some aspects. We were pretty banged up up front and uh, just trying to make some things work. They had the defensive player of the year who was the best defensive lineman we saw all year. And, you know, again, California State defensive player of the year. He'll be an NFL guy in two years if, you know, God willing, he stays healthy. He's an unbelievable player. So um, a lot of things we do with post and big concepts, whether that be on the same side of the field or coming from opposite sides, we try to create a high low scenario for defensive backs. And so on this one, um, we've got these guys are stacked here. You can line it up. You can motion to it. You can do it a number of different ways. This is 21 personnel, but it's really more of a 12 personnel set. And um, what we've got out of this is we've got a dig route here by the point man. And we've got a corner post route out of the, the deep guy here. And so I stole this from Stanford um, back, gosh, one of my first few years here. So, I mean, you know, one of the nice parts about our offense being that we're multiple, anything we see that we like, we can steal it. And so, uh, you know, one coach said, first time I'll, you know, I'll say where I got it. Second time I saw it somewhere. Third time it's mine. So, you know, <laughs> right here, it's, it's kind of hard to see somewhat from the end zone. I mean, we'll see the end result. But um, we get the play action here. Running back does a great job helping pick up the edge against the guy I was talking about. Washes him by. And, and we get the post here on a quarter safety. And so the dig was able to get on his toes. That's a big thing we talk about. Um, and so this is our second true home game this year with our project we had going on. But really, the guy we're trying to get is right here. So, I mean, if we can influence this guy, you know, backside, these guys are playing flat-footed. If we get him to jump the dig, this guy thinks he's got help inside. We break to the corner. We break back to the post. There's no one there. And so you'll be able to see it here from this aspect. Um, in terms of where they're at. So there's the dig you see coming in by number 12. Number one pushes at the toes of the corner, runs a great route. We're back to the middle of the field with all kinds of space to work, great ball. And, um, you know, that gave us the lead back in the game. It was a tight game. 
really good competition throughout the game. And that one put us ahead for good through the rest of the game. Um, and then, so same route here, just different personnel groups. Now we're in 20 personnel, same thing. These guys aren't as stacked here, so it doesn't give it away as much. Um, but really working that post dig concept. So again, now we're going to watch this safety here is a guy we need to get. And um, late in the game for us here, this was a fourth quarter play, get the dig, pull him down, get the post behind it. And so, I mean, that's a tough thing. You know, we had our freshman guys a red shirt for us and they'd be asking our defensive coordinator when we had them play quarters in practice doing um, service team look and ask our D coordinator, Coach Stacey, what do I do in quarters? I got to dig in a post. And he said, if you figure that out, let me know. And uh, <laughs> you know, question. so, but that's again, just trying to create conflict. So here, you get him to bite, easy read for the quarterback, got bites to dig. Um, you know, the rest of the route concept, not a bad catch there. Yeah, so go ahead and make, hey. make the one handers, not, not a bad deal. Um, great, great catch. And then the rest of the concept for us, we do have a flat route working out here that we can put kind of a better athlete out here. Could be a tailback, could be a tight end, some of the runs a little bit better. Um, and we let them continue up on a shake route up the sideline as this clears out. So they get a one-on-one -on -one with a flat defender. If this guy comes to flat too much, we run a lot of flat routes. If these guys get too nosy on the flat route, they have a wheel route here up the sideline, and then we have an under route coming from the other side of the field to replace all of it to check it down if nothing's open. So, I mean, just trying to give our quarterback options. Um, obviously, you're not going to get to your fourth read a bunch of times. Um, just at the level we play, you know, teams are too good and coaches are too good. So now here it is with motion again. Um, quarters look here, the same thing. Safety here on the 40-yard line. That's the guy. Um, this is our first play of the game. So, you know, again, I'm not afraid to call anything at any point. A great route here by the guy in motion. Pushes it out. Does a great job being patient to the corner and then getting back to the middle of the field. Um, and, you know, I'd love to see better ball leverage here. He's swinging this thing around, about to make me have a heart attack. But um, <laughs> he gets in the end zone. You know, that's a good way to start a football game. See our guys fired up. You know, and that's one of their big philosophy I stress, our big guys. You know, I mean, you, you better be the first one to get down the end zone. So uh, we had a practice this year where we practiced celebrating because uh, our guys like to do the, the you know, so-called, probably not very PC, the fat man shuffle down uh, to, for the extra point. And I'm not about that. You know, you get down there and you celebrate with your teammates. So uh, we practiced a whole 15-play period of celebrating touchdowns on a Thursday. So we got a little conditioning in. But um, – I love that. You know, play the game. Be excited for your teammates. You know, I mean, you scored that touchdown too. And Doesn't so, that cut into your trick play practice time on Thursday? <laughs> on Thursday, we're pretty much done by then. Yeah, we're pretty much got them in. So, um, but but again, you know, we got the protection up front. So let's talk about the pro real quick. Low hat, right guard, right tackle on the side. You're faking too is extremely important. So we pull the backer up there. You know, if it's enough to hold the safety, that's typically enough to get behind him. Doesn't always have to be enough to make him jump it. But if it's enough to just make him stay flat-footed, it gives us a chance. So, um, you know, and again, these are over a number of years. This is another year. Again, 20 personnel. We, we snuck a tail back in here, full back again, quarters. Guy bites it. Same thing. So um, I'll try to see if we can get to one more concept here. We got this a few times. So this is us actually hitting the shake route right here. So you can see this one um, with the shake route. Got the motion. Full back. This is our true full back running it. He was a very good athlete, big body, but – Try to throw him a bone once in a while for all that lead nice ISO that we run. Let him touch the ball. And a uh, big play for him down the sideline. So this time, same concept. Now we hit the shake route again. Now it's the tight end that's lined up off the ball. So we get the flat, not there, and get it to him up the sideline. So, you know, and again, a lot of it for us with these plays, I mean, different guys could get it on different weeks. And we're trying to find ways just to get different guys involved. So that's the biggest thing for us with our offense and then with uh, uh, multiple personnel groups, formations that we try to do. It's really just about trying to give different guys opportunities. When I played at Boise State my senior year, I think our leading guy, he had, you know, 35, 40 catches. So it wasn't a one-man show. I mean, we had probably five guys with 25 or more catches. So there were a lot of different guys, depending on the week, that were going to touch the ball. You know, every week's not going to be your week, but at some point you're going to get your shot. And so, you know, it's really more about being selfless and doing your part and, uh, you know, doing your job. So sometimes you're going to set somebody else up and later on they're going to come back and return the favor. Love it. Coach, that's yeah. awesome, man. Thanks for taking us through that. Uh, uh, I am go back to the field and coach one day. We're, we're definitely going to institute a celebration period. We're celebrating <laughs> touchdowns. Celebrate all wins, a famous coach once said. So You got to.
Yeah. Hey, put the kids in a position to be successful. You can't expect them to know what to do if you don't give them a chance to practice it, right? So yeah. that's, uh, that's good stuff. Well, hey, I appreciate you taking us through that. That's awesome. Uh, this has been, uh, been a, 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 an exceptional chalk talk period with both of you. So appreciate you guys walking us through that. Um, we'll wrap things up here now. And uh, one of the things that we talk about at E-Team Sponsor all the time is educate and empower. That's our role that we play in making sure that we can help, uh, you know, uh, unlock opportunity for athletic programs through the easiest fundraiser ever. So uh, education is a big part of that and empowerment is a big part. Uh, we always like to end our chalk talks with a message of empowerment from the leaders of the respective programs that we have on the show. So, uh, you know, uh, Coach Noonan, we'll start with you. Uh, it's, uh, it's challenging times right now. We're all going through it, but uh, football season is going to come. I'm very positive uh, we're going to have that season and uh, been doing a lot of research on the science and and the data that's out there, and uh, we're, we're going to have a football season. So knowing that that's coming down the pipe, what message of empowerment would you share with, with coaches that are listening to the show today? Well, with players, I would, I would share with them that when, when the decision comes down the pipes that we're going to be playing, it's going to happen fast. And if they're not taking care of business on their own, they're going to be in a world of shock uh, going up against guys that have been doing stuff on their own. So, you know, um, they got to be that high character. What are you doing when nobody's watching type of deal, you know? Um, you know, and, and the other thing is to the players, it's obviously not, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. I know that's cliche, but it's very true. You know, junior college is an incredible opportunity for young men that need to develop physically or academically or, or both. And Coach Snelling and myself and other junior college coaches up and down the state of California that, that sponsor non-scholarship football. These kids come out and they pay their own money and they pay their own way and they grind and we're not holding their hand to study hall and we're not class checking every class like all these other JCs that got all these scholarships and dorms and meal plans and all that other stuff. So you, you come out to a California community college, you're going to be self-motivated when you leave here um, and you're going you're, to you're do well because you're not used to having anyone hold your hand. So, you know, just be self-motivated in everything you do in life. You know, be that guy that's, that's grinding when nobody's watching. And then the last thing I like to tell our guys all the time is uh, remember who you are and who you represent. You know, you, you, you're not just representing yourself. You're re representing this football team, which represents the athletic department, which uh, represents the entire school, community, so on and so forth. So just remember who you are and who you represent. Um, when you're when you're wearing that Sierra College gear out there in the community, and act right, you know, do if it, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. You know? I love it. Great message for for student athletes out there, and uh, from Coach Noonan, uh, Rob. How about yourself? A message of empowerment for our listeners today. Yeah, very similar. You know, more so talking to the players out there. Just that I know it's a challenging time, and um, trying to make sure that you you get what you need done, and you know, trying to find a way to set up a realistic schedule for yourself but at the end of the day you know you're accountable to yourself and your opportunities are really going to be um, you know either given to you or taken away from you by how much work you want to put in and like coach said you know ultimately you got to be self-motivated and if you think that you know things are just going to happen it, it doesn't really work that way and uh, you know, we talk to our guys about all the time and uh, just a lot of a lot of similar themes like coach said and I think a lot of programs anywhere across the country talk to at any level it's just you know you want guys to be able to leave in a better place than they came in. You know, that's our ultimate goal is that you come here, you figure some things out about yourself as a person, as a student, as an athlete, you create some opportunities for yourself based on how much you're willing to work and how much you're willing to sacrifice. And, um, you know, those, those, those opportunities will be there for you on the other side. And so it's going to be the same thing now. I mean, it's the same situation. It's a little bit different. The circumstances are, are the same for everyone in a sense. I would say that everyone's in the same situation to where, everyone's kind of on their own right now. You know, a lot of people are doing what we're doing. They're on these Zoom calls. They're watching film. They're talking on the phone and trying to keep people going. But at the end of the day, the people that are going to be the most successful, the people that are willing to work, like Coach said, when no one's watching. And uh, that's, that's the biggest thing. And so I think that uh, a lot of us as coaches already know that. And, uh, you know, it's just tough to get every single player to, to understand that. And unfortunately, um, not every one of them will get it. And, you know, and that's hard, you know, for us as coaches, you know, it's just like, you know, you really want everyone to get it. You want everyone to understand it and you want everyone to succeed. Um, and, you know, we're going to do our very best to make that happen, you know, but at the end of the day, also it's, you know, there has to be some investment on their side too. And if they do it, 
you know, we hold up our end of the deal, like Coach Newell will tell you at their place. If you do, you know, the things we're asking you to do, there's a reason for it. There's a blueprint with how we do things, and it's been successful for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, we're all doing this because we love seeing people leave in a great place and, and have opportunities and tell our guys all the time, you know, when it's all done and you're done playing ball, you're done going to school and you're out into the working world, and, you know, you want to be in a situation where you can do some things you want to do instead of doing what you have to do. And so, you know, I mean, you got to go, you know, obviously a lot of our guys are going to go on and become husbands and fathers and you know, workers in the community. And it's like, hey, you know, you got to start thinking in those terms too. I mean, and start putting some thought into that. Not that they're quite there yet. You know, I mean, our, some people at our school give me a bad time because I still call them kids. And I go, hey, most of them are 18, 19 years old. They're they still are. dressing. <laughs> and, um, you know, again, not very PC, but our D-line coach for 30 years and uh, still our equipment guy. You know, used to joke around because, you know, Coach Noonan's probably heard it. And you heard of you, Coach. You know, people say, I'm a grown-ass man. And he ah. said, no, you're not. He said, you're a growing-ass man. He said, you're growing. He said, you know, when you stand on your own two feet, you got a job, and you got a family, and you can take care of yourself and take care of others, then we can talk about that, you know. But right now, we're building towards that. And so, you know, I mean, that's – and that's what we want to do, you know. I mean, for all of us, I mean, we just want to see guys be successful in whatever, you know, in whatever path life takes them. And – you know, it's not even football for all of them. Some guys are going to go on and do different things. I mean, some guys play their last snap for us. And, you know, last year I had a guy that you know, he's going to go pursue a music career. I'm like, all right, let's sit down and look at music schools in Southern California. You know, what are you, what are you looking for? What are you looking at? You know, it's not always just football. Um, but, you know, for us, it's, it's just a way, you know, football is that tool to help us get that relationship with him and help him get where he wants to get. Love it. I love it. That's a great message of empowerment from, from both of you. I think that, Football is the, I feel, it's the greatest vehicle from a sports standpoint to teach young men and women about life. And, uh, what, you know, I think um, as, the, as, as coaches and uh, student athletes, people that are listening to the podcast, I think they, it, it's safe for them to assume at this point, listening to both of you, Coach Noonan and Coach Snelling, uh, you guys do a tremendous job running your programs. You're obviously there for the development of the student athletes. You're there for the right reasons um, and, uh, and helping these, you know, bring them in and move them on and uh, doing all the right things for the student athletes. So uh, pleasure to have both of you guys on. Thanks for sharing as much as you did. Um, we definitely got to get you guys back on here again. Uh, I know uh, uh, whenever the football season starts this year, uh, you know, obviously the, the best of luck to both of you and your respective programs, but uh, hopefully everybody stays healthy and safe until then. And when the lights get turned on and the scoreboard flicks on, I know you two are both going to have, Sierra College and Butte College uh, ready to rock and roll. I know that for sure. So we don't we don't have lights. Neither one of us. Yeah, no, oh, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah, neither one has lights. So you guys, when you play at home, one o'clock on Saturdays. We, one o'clock was... in Chico or Rockland. It's nice and cool. Come on, Bay Area. <laughs> nice and cool. Yeah, one ten. That's why we played Friday nights at DVC. <laughs> yep. Shorter week, play at night. We get the extra yep. day to go prepare for 110. We had to play you guys. Yep. So. Uh, uh, that's good stuff. Well, hey, guys, we really appreciate you hop, uh, coming on. Um, and, again, looking forward to having you guys catching up with you down the road. Uh, hopefully when the uh, season does take off this year, get a chance to, to come out and see you guys play. Uh, wherever your travels will take you. So thanks again, guys, for coming on, and we'll talk to you guys down the road. Thanks a bunch, Ron. Talk to you soon, Robbie. You, you know what's